Okay, so this is part of a segment about strain measurement. So um, what we usually do when we measure stresses is actually we measure strains. If you think about it, stress is the strain energy density in the material. That's uh, its units. It's um, uh, joules per meter cubed or megapascals, newtons per meter squared. Um, and so it's actually quite difficult to measure. In fact, it, even if you look at a tensile testing machine, the load cell there is actually measuring the deflection. It's actually a strain measurement device that's calibrated to turn that strain into a load. So we usually, we can only measure strains. And there are several ways to do that. One is you can bond on a strain gauge onto the sample. Uh, here are some of these little orange things on here. Um, and what they do is uh, they have little foils. Uh, it's a little plastic foil with a, uh, a copper grid laid on it. And as you stretch the copper grid, it gets longer and thinner. So its resistivity increases. So you can use that as a way of measuring strain. If you want to measure the residual stresses in a material, so this is a, a welded plate uh, with uh, the weld beads along the middle. And there's a stress distribution around the weld. Um, and what you do, what's been done here, is little holes have been drilled in the centre of those strain gauges. And as the material has relaxed around the hole, then the displacement around that has been measured by the strain gauges, which has enabled us to back calculate, uh, with the aid of a finite element model, what the stresses were and what the strains were before we drilled the hole. Um, if you uh, can't do that, the, the other method uh, that's most favoured uh, is usually um, to use diffraction. So uh, we use the spacing of the planes in the material, the interatomic spacing, as a measure of the elastic strain um, in the material. So uh, you'll recall from first year we had Bragg's law. So if we've got a series of planes in our material that are a separation D, which will relate to a particular HKL plate, if we've got an incident beam of radiation and an outgoing beam of radiation, then those outgoing beams will be uh, in a state of constructive interference if this extra path length here, this extra path length here, is a whole number of wavelengths. So this extra path length here is actually d sine theta. There's two of them, and if that's a whole number of wavelengths, then you'll get constructive interference, and that's called Bragg's law. Now, we defined strain as being uh, a change in spacing or a change in length. So if we measured the change in D, then we'd have a measure of strain, um, which is very convenient. And we can um, find out what delta D should be if we differentiate Bragg's law. If we're using constant wavelength radiation, well, let's just differentiate it. We'll ignore the N. We'll have uh, partial lambda is equal to 2 partial d sine theta um, plus twice d partial theta cos theta. Now, if there's no change in wavelength, because we're using the same x-ray diffractometer with the same x-rays, then we've got a zero there, so we can cancel the twos immediately. If we want to find partial d over d, we'll bring that over there. So we'll have partial d sine theta is equal to minus um, d partial theta cos theta. If we bring the d down and bring the sine down, we'll have partial d over d is minus, uh, sorry, partial theta times cos theta over sine theta, which is equal to minus partial theta cot theta. I'm going to switch to a better pen. So what we have here is that our strain is minus partial theta times the cotangent of theta. OK, very nice. And we've just done that by differentiating. Very cool. Um, now, how does this work on, a, on an actual instrument? Um, what we do is we'll have our, our incident beam of radiation. That'll probably be coming through some slits. It'll have some size to it. And we'll have a detector over here. So this angle here, that's 2 theta, because this was theta and this was theta. So that whole angle is 2 theta. 
So the angle that we've defracted from, that is this angle, is 2 theta. And we'll have a detector here. We'll have a little box with, uh, that detects x-rays. And it only detects those that are coming through from the sample past this slit. And these two slits will define a gauge volume in our object. Um, OK, our slit has to be outside our object. Fair enough. Uh, there's our slit. There's my detector. And we can translate the object around and map out the change in the despacing. So this is our normal vector of our plane. So that's the strain we're measuring. We're measuring the change in the plane spacing there. And that gives us a measure of the strain in that direction. And we could, if we put our detector over here, say, there's our slit, we'd be measuring it in that direction. So we could do measurements in three perpendicular directions. If those were the principal strains, we'd then measure the strain in three uh, principal directions. We could then turn that into a stress. And that's the, the principle of strain measurement. Um, that's kind of cool. Um, so the sort of thing you could do um, is <coughs> I could take my welded piece and I could arrange it on a diffractometer. So I'll have my welded piece here, something like that. There's my piece. There's my weld. If I want to look at this location here, I'll have a beam going in, a beam going out. As long as their bisector is in the plane, I measure the strain in the normal direction. And then this angle here, 2 theta. Um, and there's my outgoing beam, there's my ingoing beam. And I can move my plate around and measure the strains. And as I say, I could do that in three perpendicular directions. Let's call them the longitudinal direction, the transverse direction, and the normal direction. So the normal to the sheet, the length of the sheet, and the transverse direction of the sheet. And I can measure the strains that way. And that's what we'll do in a moment. So this is a very handy way to find uh, stresses in materials. And it's probably the premier method for uh, measuring strains and, and stresses, it, particularly residual stresses. And it's used quite widely um, for the most highest integrity uh, components, so things like jet engine disks, welds in nuclear reactors, and so on. So uh, here's a, uh, and the sort of places you go are places where you can, I mean, there, there are two ways you can do this. Ideally, you want to do this with something that penetrates a long way into the material. And ideally, you want to do it with a gauge volume that's kind of cubic so that you have a nice arrangement. So ideally, you want your wavelength here to be such that you get a theta um, of 45 degrees or a 2 theta of 90 degrees. That'll give you a nice cubical gauge volume because you'll be in this sort of diffraction position where 2 theta here is 90 give you a nice cubic gauge volume. The other nice thing, if 2 theta is 90, theta is 45. So cot theta is equal to 1 if theta is 45 degrees. So that's very nice. So you want a wavelength that gives you that. But you also want to be able to penetrate deep into the material as opposed to measuring in the surface. And that ends up meaning that you want a probe uh, that doesn't interact very strongly with materials, uh, which means you want neutrons. X-rays are nice. Uh, there are problems with x-rays. So uh, neutrons, you can have penetration, and you can have lambda such that theta is 45. You can have both of those. With low energy x-rays, the penetration depth is only about 20 micrometers for the right sort of wavelength. But the right sort of wavelength you can generate um, using lab x-rays, using copper K-alpha. If you use high-energy x-rays, such as you find at a, a synchrotron source, um, so that's something like 70 keV or uh, 0.14 angstroms in wavelength, then you get the penetration. But then theta is something like 4 or 5 degrees, so probably 2 to 6 degrees. And then your gauge volume is very elongated. You're very much doing this, and you have a very long diamond-shaped gauge volume, very long and thin. But that's what we would do at a synchrotron. So um, and there is a way of coping with this low penetration depth of low-energy x-rays to measure the strains in a surface, which is called the sine squared psi method. But that's a bit more complicated, so I'm not going to talk about this in a second-year course. Um, 
But for neutrons, well, that's fine. You go to a nuclear reactor and you tap off a beam of neutrons from the side of the reactor. Um, and that's what's being done in, in this picture. Here you've got an incident beam coming from uh, the back of the picture through that little slit there, that little nose, into our sample, which is the little square. Um, and then going out to a detector that's on the right-hand side. Uh, we can move our sample around in three angles in that little cradle there, and we can move it around in X, Y, Z. Um, and uh, we can move the detector arm around, um, and that enables us to do the measurement. Um, another possibility is you arrange theta to be 90 and leave the detector fixed, um, and uh, let lambda vary. And that's what happens at a time-of-flight neutron source. There, what you have is you have a proton beam comes in and hits a target. So you get protons going in. And the target tantalum or lead or something then becomes excited um, and splits in two in a process called spallation and emits neutrons. Um, and those guys we then moderate and then take down to a beam line to our sample and from uh, the time it takes them to get into the detector, then uh, we can relate that back to the velocity, because we know how far the detector is from the original source. Um, and that means we know the energy, which means we know the wavelength. So there, what we actually do is we vary lambda rather than theta as a way of measuring d. And then it's all the same sort of math, and it's fine. Um, that's called time of flight neutron diffraction, which is what happens at ISIS in Oxfordshire, which is a neutron source. And that's what's pictured here. Here you can see we're making uh, a measurement where the beam is coming in from the top right into these two big detectors on the left and right hand side. And we're measuring the strains around a well while we're making it, which is very good fun. Um, and for high energy X-ray diffraction, somewhere like an X-ray synchrotron, like the one in Diamond or at ESRF, um, these are really big facilities. Um, we take a, a, a beam of X-rays into our hutch, and then we measure uh, the uh, diffraction peaks that occur at relatively small angles, and again do X-ray diffraction. So this is a nice way to find stresses. So let's do an example. Um, of, of doing that. For this welded plate here. And what we've got is we've got a situation where we've arranged for theta to be 45 degrees, so it's equal to 1. We've got aluminium with a modulus of 70 GPA and a new of 0.3. And we've got a diffraction angle um, where uh, the change in diffraction angle, so partial theta, is equal to, and I'm going to say it's minus 0.12 degrees in the longitudinal direction, and partial theta in the transverse direction is equal to uh, minus 0.06 degrees. So we can find the strain in the longitudinal direction is equal to um, minus partial theta cot theta. Cot theta is 1, so it's equal to minus partial theta. So that's equal to 0.12, but we've got to convert it to radians. So 180 degrees is pi radians, so we multiply by pi over 180. And that gives us, um, and we've got to use, uh, this was a change in 2 theta, sorry the change in the diffraction angle we measured. So we measured 2 theta. So then we've got to make it into partial theta. So we have to multiply by a half. And that gives us a strain of 0.001. And if we do for the same for strain transverse, it's minus partial theta, which is a half, 0.06. The minus sign here is taken care of times pi over 180. And that gives us uh, 0.0005. OK. So we've got our strains, and we know this is a thin sheet, so sigma normal is zero. And we've assumed that uh, these are the principal strains, so there are no shears. So we know that the stress matrix, therefore, looks like sigma long, sigma trans, with zeros everywhere else. And we know that the strain matrix looks like strain long, strain trans. We don't know what strain 
normal is and zero is everywhere else. Uh, it must be zero is everywhere else because if you've got no stress, you just get the shear modulus directly and therefore you know it's zero. Um, so now we've got to, what we've got to do is we've got to find out what these are. So we'll put these in here just for convenience. 0.0005. So this is where the power of the dark side comes in. Sorry, the power of Lamé's constants. So we know that sigma uh, 1, 1, for instance, is equal to 2g strain 1, 1 plus lambda strain 1, 1 plus strain 2, 2 plus strain 3, 3. That is the sum of the normal strains. And 2g, we can just work out, 2g is equal to e over 1 plus mu. So that's uh, 53.8 gigapascals if you work it out. And we know that lambda is mu e over 1 plus mu 1 minus 2 mu. And if you work that out, that gives you 40.4 gigapascals. Um, so then we now need to work out what the sigmas are. Now the thing to notice is we don't know strain normal, so we don't know it in there, so we can't work out any of the sigmas. But if we take the third one, so sigma normal, which is equal to zero, that's equal to uh, 2g times strain normal plus lambda strain one uh, plus, sorry, strain long plus strain trans plus strain normal. So that's equal to, if we come down here, 2g plus lambda strain normal plus lambda strain L plus strain T. So we can work it out. We can say that strain normal is equal to minus lambda uh, strain L plus strain T divided by 2g plus lambda. We know strain L and T. They add together to be 0 0.0015. We know lambda and g. So we know strain normal. Uh, that gives us um, a, a strain normal of minus 0 0.00064. So we know these guys also as, as delta, as the dilatation. And if we sum those up, we get a delta of 0 0.00085. Okay. So now, uh, if I pick a bit of whiteboard over here, um, now if I go and put those in for strain L and, uh, sigma L and sigma T, I'll find sigma L is equal to 2G times strain L plus lambda delta. I know delta, I know lambda, I know G, 2G, I know strain L, so it all works out, and I get an answer um, of 88 megapascals. And I know strain T, sigma T in the same way, and that'll come out to be 61 megapascals. So I get an answer here of 88 and 61 megapascals. Okay, so what I did to do the problem was I knew two of the strains and one of the stresses, and I knew that all the others were zero, and then I set up these simultaneous equations and solve them. Um, and that was kind of nice. So that's how you do a stress measurement problem for the case of plain stress. And that's very commonly applied. You know, I've, I've written journal papers on doing exactly this. Um, and that's a very nice uh, way to go to measure strains uh, and measure stresses. And that's how that works. Uh, so that's it for this uh, segment.